Hi, I'm Douglas Vogt from the Diehl Foundation. And this is uh, Series 4, Part 5A, which will cover um, the hard way, specifically, how, the, um, how to survive this polarversal cataclysm. And there'll be a Part B to this thing, because when I was doing the script, I came up, I had like about 85 or 90 PowerPoint slides, and I said, that's too much. That would be like an hour, hour and a half of, of uh, talking, and I thought it was too much for anybody. I, I try to keep these things like a half hour to 45 minutes to make it easy for you. Anyway, so part five is going to be 5A and 5B. 5A, this one, is going to be why I think this reversal is going to happen uh, during the next Gleisberg cycle which is in between September and December 2046. That's really important. It, if I can prove that or how, why I think it, you'll understand why I'm doing these videos and you'll understand the pressure we're all on. And anyway, you'll get the idea. The part B will have um, where to go to survive this thing, what to build, and also the sequence of events that happen 50 years before, during the event, and also after the event, so you understand what to prepare for and, and what actually happens. <clears throat> the stuff I'm going to be covering is from my first book, Reality Reveal, which is, I did this 42 years ago. It has a great section, chapter 11 in here, on the mythologies. Chapter 10 is on pyramids found all over the world. It's out of print. Uh, I probably will reprint some of the, some of the chapters in the book. Uh, I have a CD of it, a PDF. It's 10 bucks plus three dollars for shipping. If you're overseas, it would be four bucks for shipping, for mailing. The rest of it comes from chapters eight and other chapters here in God's Day Judgment. There's, I think, 77 hardbound copies left at Amazon. It's going to be sent to the printers in a couple of weeks, and we'll have of paperbacks, and it'll be for maybe around 20 bucks. So uh, bear with me on if, if it runs out, then it will be in stock again, but it may take a month to do it. Okay, the first thing, how did I come up with the 12,068 number? Now, much of this is a review of what earlier videos were, and I put that in the videos, the series one, part one B, that was how I found the clock cycle. So six blank periods in space. Here's what it looks like. Four of the six were 12,068 light years apart. This is the, uh, a brief shot of the database that I created of all known stars, open clusters, and globular clusters in our galaxy. And how I made this stuff show up, this is right over here. I basically zero, zero, and that way you go to bottom and you're able to see where the where the blank period was. So anyways, it was like 12,068 light years from here to there, there to there, et cetera. So that's how I came up with the number. This is a, a fast review. Gleisberg cycle, eight sunspot cycles, is totaled 88.73 years. The last one was 1957-58. There's the spike. Now, it's a series of eight, so it starts about 1880s. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and the eighth, and then it drops down. But last time it dropped down not this far. You see, there it is, and here it is. And number two, three, and four in the cycle were much higher than two, three, and four in the previous cycle. So it gives you an idea that the sun's output is increasing. And these are the two videos that you can go watch a more complete explanation. The third thing, I found basically 11 things. I'm, this is the third in, in the list. Uh, here's the Gleisberg cycle. 136 Gleisberg cycles is 12,068 years. Uh, the sunspot cycle, naturally, 1,088 is the 12,068. But we found five more. I didn't. Two Russian geologists did. And there's the period, 2,400 years, 928. They found 940. It was a difference of no more than 1% on some of these things. 
well within the standard deviation for carbon-14 dating, 710, 574, 502, times these numbers for these cycles also equals 12,068. In other words, I, if we're in a synchronous system, which I believe I proved in series one, they all have to sync to the main clock cycle. The next Gleisberg cycle is between September and December 2046. Can't get away from it. <clears throat> Fourth item, carbon-14 dating. Here's where I've mentioned it in the videos, series one, four, and these are the numbers here. Now, what's important about the carbon-14 dating, if we were like four or 5,000 years or 3,000 years away, then these carbon-14 dates would be more like eight or 9,000 or 10,000 years in the past. Not the 12 and, 12 and 13, you know, within the standard deviation, it's about 12,000. So that was the case, so I found 12,000, 24,000 years ago, all again grouped around there. So that was number four. And, and that video I had, these had a lot more uh, of carbon-14 dating. This is just a, a minor sample to refresh your memory. Fifth, the glass beads, microtactites, uh, nickel iron microtactites found in sedimentary layers. This one is the Clovis extinction. It's, it's dated about 12,000 uh, years ago. They tried, I showed in one of the videos, I believe it was um, 4C or 4D, that they were playing games with the carbon-14 data to try to minimize it and um, throw it off by as much as 2,000 years. So ignore what this is, calibration, CAL, ignore it. Go to the carbon-14 dating instead. Anyway, so what's interesting about this one, uh, I say in the model that the Earth's rotation goes two different arrays. Right now, it goes from, it rotates, we rotate like this. After this reversal, we go this way. So the last time, the Atlantic Ocean, this is, I think, in, in either Arizona or New Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean ran, ran across the continent, a good chunk of it. So we have this much sediment. But the other way, the other cycle, it was the Pacific rushing over the continent, a lot bigger ocean and a lot closer to the ocean. Look how much sediment here. Unfortunately, the guy didn't dig further down to see how far down it actually went. Uh, here's another example of uh, Mastodon bones found. They carbon-14 dated 11,100, but it's probably the 12,000 because just below is 12,600 right by his feet. So this is probably in between. It's probably the 12,000. Uh, so that gives you an idea. So there's a lot of sediment like this and fossils found which carbon-14 date around 12,000 years ago. Six, the decay rate of Earth's geomagnetic field. NASA has produced articles like this one, Earth's inconsistent con magnetic field. Our planet's magnetic field is in a constant state of change. Say researchers who are beginning to understand how it be behaves and why. There it is, there's the link. They're basically admitting, and other articles too, that the Earth's magnetic field is in the process of reversing. You've seen, many of you who've been online, who've searched for polar reversal, magnetic reversal, have seen a lot of articles that say the same thing. The government, NASA, is not going to overtly say, hey, yeah, guess what, we're in the middle of a reversal, because they know what it means, and they don't want to scare the public. But anyway, that's number six. Uh, another example of Earth's magnetic fields. These are more journal articles I found. Uh, Earth's magnetic poles could start to flip. What happens then? Journal physics. Is the Earth's magnetic field reversing? That's by who? Earth and planetary science letters. There's the volume. There's the page number. The abstract. Earth's dipole field, that's magnetic field, has been diminishing in strength since the first systematic observations of the field intensities were made in the mid-19th century. This has led to speculation that the geomagnetic field might now 
be in the early stages of a reversal. This is what she's talking about then, back in the 1800s. And this is uh, 2015, uh, 2,922 nanoteslas. It doesn't have to go to zero to reverse. I've seen some journal articles, they thought 15 nanoteslas, and it could go to 20 and then reverse and then flip. Then you get a big spike of energy in the center of the Earth, which makes it even more interesting on the surface. Seven, solar activity has increased since the last Gleisberg cycle in 1871. Here's your, the last one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. November, uh, December, January of 57, 58. There it is. And it dropped down. But look, it didn't exactly drop down to that, did it? Here's the three, way up there. The total solar irradiance. Um, here's another one on global land and sea surface temperature. Again, since there's our reversal, our, our um, Gleisberg cycle, and it's going steadily up. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with, with man-made carbon-14. It doesn't. It never did. That cover story was created by Bowker, William Bowker from Le Mans Doherty. He was a geologist who, who wrote an article in 77, I think it was. I have the article. And he blames uh, global warming on man-made carbon dioxide. He's the first. He just died in February, and he, they've labeled him the grandfather of global warming. They said global warming fraud. Now, it's, they want you to think that you're creating and hurting mommy Earth and global warming, because they don't want you to think that it's the sun, which they can't and you can't do anything about. <laughs> Worse yet, what is it going to do, and why is it increasing its output? That's, you have to be smart and realize they have ulterior motives to make you think that you're the one causing global warming. There's warming, all right. It has nothing to do with you. This would be going on if nobody was on the planet. Sea surface chamber, uh, changes and sunspots. There's one of the ways you, you determine what solar output is, is by sea surface temperature. And the blue is the sea, sur the sea surface temperature. The red is number of sunspots. And it's 100% correlation. Sunspots go up, temperature in the ocean goes up. See? Every single one. That's why you wind up having more, more uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, bad weather. Because it's the sun heating up the water. You get more clouds, more clouds, you're going to get hurricanes and God knows what else. Again, has nothing to do with mankind. Another one, temperature versus solar activity. Uh, temperature 11 year average. I hate it when they average things. That's the red line here. Uh, um, this is a solar irradiance from, here's our last Gleisberg cycle, as you can see. Went somewhat even, but the radiance or the temperature went up. So what's really happening here there's other frequencies going on, like ultraviolet light and other things that the sun is producing that isn't necessary light or incorporated in their data. But it's obviously going up at a 45 degree angle. Again, it has nothing to do with mankind. Uh, temperature anomaly, uh, solar activity, again, um, global temperature, Sunspot numbers. Again, since 19, where do we, um, do, 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 do. Where's 1950? Oh, back to here. Uh, so since the end of the last Gleisberg cycle, and it's been steadily going up. Now, the only thing we don't know is each professor or group that did this, they sometimes finagle with the numbers to make it come out to look like mankind's doing it. But generally, it's, it's all about the sun. Total solar irradiance, again. And temperature, 25 years smoothing temperature. 
Here is 1900, so it would be about here, our Gleisberg cycle, straight up. But even from the, the Gleisberg cycle that was the previous one, it's going, he's measuring going up, and the same thing here, going, going up. It's all about the sun. Number eight, government activity, and uh, they indirectly prove that I'm right. If they're doing actions that they normally wouldn't want to do, uh, or activities that, why are they doing this? Then you have to ask yourself, okay, is the reason they're doing it to cover up what's really going on, namely with the sun? Now, I, I showed in the earlier videos uh, when the last Gleisberg cycle happened and, and the sun erupted in December of 57, within less than six months, they created NASA, put out a postage stamp, and um, the Greek uh, sun god Apollo was the name of the flights that went to the moon to pick up the, the evidence that the sun novid and brought it back to the earth to go examine it. So, what's interesting about this um, ben Davidson and myself have been working on this, <laughs> figuring out what's the truth with this story. This thing was never published. There was no Emerson House in 1965. This is released by the CIA, and this is the actual records from the CIA. And it was in their general CIA records. This is internal reports. They, it got released June 24, 2013. But document creation, I mean, they didn't produce anything until three years later, three and a half years later. I don't know why it took them so long, but 2016. Publication date. Now this is the publication date internal to the CIA. This is a report. Now remember I told you that after I published um, Reality Revealed, it was in 77, early 78, uh, I got a call from Fort Lewis, and eventually I got a call from somebody who said he was a retired CIA agent, and he asked me questions regarding the book, and he asked me, how did I figure it out? And it was all, the discussion was all about the Ice Age and Polar Versals, how did I figure it out? So they knew it. They knew something was up. Remember, the space program started in 58. So they created the space program to go to the moon, publication of this paper. And what it has in there, I'll show you in a second, but they knew what was going on. Here's some other information on, and I'll step aside here. Uh, sanitized copy approved for release in 2013 but they didn't publish it until two and a half years later. It's interesting. Okay, so I try to find this stuff. I try to find the book. I try to find the publisher. Uh, Library of Congress found no results. Um, in a copy that I produced supposedly in 96, 95, that we got a copy of, it said first printing 71, second printing 73. And um, publisher, Emerson House. There is no Emerson House. But P.O. Box, Los Angeles, California, 90045. I'll bring you a little background history of myself. I'll step over here. I used to own an import-export company in, Los, in West L.A. I used to clear my goods through customs, and I used to have to go down to the airport all the time. My zip code for my mailbox was 90024. That was the post office, the base of the federal building in West LA by Wilshire Boulevard. 90045 is the airport, LA airport. Along LA, LA airport, along West Century Boulevard was US Customs, um, Homeland Security now before, CIA was there and a whole bunch of others. He picked a PO box just right by his office. I think that's hilarious. A little lazy. Made a mistake, boys. Don't do that again. So that's what happened. He, he, he picked a P.O. box right by his office. I don't know if anyone would have known that, except me, because I 
I was down there all the time clearing goods through customs. I knew some of the guys at U.S. Customs. <clears throat> okay, so again, I searched for the title. Uh, no title. This was the book that they released supposedly in November of 93. We got a copy of it, about 200 and some odd pages. It does mention the sun a couple of times innocuously. Uh, paperback, Bengal Tiger Press, supposedly in Massachusetts, still no record of it. Um, this is ISBN number. The only, the only other book that Bengal Tiger Press did was Natural Childbirth Self-Taught by him. Why? I have no idea. Okay, so this is what was in what was released by the CIA. There's been enough people doing videos about what was released. So all I care about really is did he hit the same subjects I had in Reality Revealed and my later papers? That's the only thing that really mattered. Of course, the continent, a thousand mile an hour wind racks its, its unholy vintage, blah, blah, blah. I explained in one of the earlier videos that the sun nova, I believe, over which China, about right here. 17 to 18 hours later, the dust shell hit here. What's on the other side of the earth? Siberia, where all the mastodons, woolly uh, rhinoceroses, um, cave lions and stuff like that were found fast frozen, certainly mummified. The reason why is Boyle's Law. When this dust shell hit this, it evacuated a lot of the atmosphere on this side of the Earth. After the dust shell passes us, this side is normal atmospheric pressure. This side is extremely low. Oh, i got to hold it up higher, sorry. So what happens is where its normal atmospheric pressure expands dr dramatically around the globe to fill up extremely low atmospheric pressure. That's what was going on. They took that one from me, but or they may have figured out this is what's going to happen. Uh, I'm sure they had to have maybe figured out there's got to be some kind of a dust shell that's going to hit us. The next was earthquakes leave no place untouched. That's pretty obvious. The earthquakes happen because this globe stops and then goes in the other direction. Well, just like the oceans keep going, the earth, the crust of the earth is also swimming on a sea of heated up magma. So what's going to happen? It's going to bang up against each other. And like I showed in one of the earlier videos, there's many mountain ranges, that, uh, both in the ocean and on the land, that have a north-south orientation, which is perpendicular to the direction of force. Um, Earth's molten sublayer breaks through and spreads a sea of white-hot liquid lava. I show an example of that in eastern Washington, just west of Spokane, Washington. Uh, a bunch of, it was a sea of magma, but the ground shook so much, it set up standing waves. So you got these little lumps all over, thousands of lumps all over the place that set up standing waves for all of the, the, sea, the sea of magma. Gives you an idea how much the earth shook and how long it shook. But they had that there. Within three hours, the fantastic wall of water moves across the continent Bearing the wind-ravaged land under two miles of seething water coast to coast. Well, that kind of wrong there of the sequence. The water happens immediately, but they're admitting the same thing I'm doing. Remember, this is stuff from the CIA. They're on the same page as me. Ignore some of the dates. For all we know, this thing was created in the 70s, well, 80s or 90s after they got my book. We don't know. Remember. It's the art of deception. So they also know well, this thing's going to go this way, but not a, a thousand miles an hour. And it's not going to be two miles deep. Uh, the Earth slows down before this thing happens. A lot of the mythologies say the same thing, and it makes sense. As the Earth's magnetic field starts decaying exponentially, it's going to really slow down. So it may only be instead of a thousand miles an hour here, maybe 800 miles an hour. But the water has mass and the gravity has Gravity hasn't gone away. So the very mass of the planet and the mass of the water is going to control how fast it really goes across 
the continents. But three or 400 miles an hour, maybe five in the very beginning, totally possible. But anyway, he goes through it. In a fraction of a day, all of the uh, vestiges of civilization are gone. And the great cities, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Dallas, New York, are nothing but legends. Barely a stone is left where millions walked just a few hours before. A little flowery, but it's pretty obvious if the ocean's going to come across the continents. It's going to wipe the place clean. Once more, the Earth has shifted its 60-mile thick shell with the poles moving almost to the equator in a fraction of a, of a day. That's wrong. That is wrong. Like I showed, in the center of the Earth, what makes the, 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 the rotation of the Earth and the heat also, is like a center modulation point, so really in the shape of like a big toroid. I don't know how big the toroid is, but when it reverses, direction of the information going instead of counterclockwise, it goes clockwise, the field just reverses. It doesn't go to here and then go back again. It doesn't do that. There's no evidence to that effect either. No geological evidence. Uh, so apparently once every few thousand years, natural matter escapes from the 860 mile radius. Oh, they're trying to figure out the core of the Earth. They have it wrong. They don't know. But like I said, that's what they taught in the schools back in the 50s and 60s. They didn't know what caused it. Uh, Greece, land of... Uh, they go through the mythologies in, in his book. That's just like I did with Reality Revealed here. Chapter 11, which you can have online. If you go onto VectorPub.com, I strongly suggest this. And click on the picture of the book, go to Chapter 11. The whole chapter is there. Yeah, ask your text file and read it. It's your ancestors screaming from the grave that something terrible happened to them. I'll go into that more in part B, which I'm going to do the same day today. <clears throat> Eighth, government activity again. Here's my book. It was first indexed psychical research. Kind of an insult. There's only one chapter in this book that explains, explains the parapsychology and psychic phenomena, and that's chapter seven. So I had a reason to go to Washington, D.C. in uh, 1994, uh, about the middle of the month, 17th, 18th of my aunt and uncle, my wife, my kid. I see museums, but when I was there, I went to the Library of Congress. I wanted to find out why they indexed it that. So the year before, 93, about November, I was on Laura Lee's radio show. She let me host it. And for the whole night, I wound up explaining the whole thing Ice Age, Polar Versal, the causes of it, everything that happens. So, okay, I show up at a Library of Congress, and she looks. And she, this is the printout. It's got an unusual symbols they've got on this. This is from a line printer, no less. <laughs> and on April 4th, 1994, the CIA reclassified my book, Q175, Science, Philosophy. And even a title like God's Day of Judgment, they index Q175. I don't know too many books <coughs> from authors that the CIA or other intelligence agencies reclassify. Do you? I don't. That's the truth of it. When they did that, I knew they were on the same page as, as myself. They knew what I had figured out, and I knew who had heard the broadcast. More of government uh, activities. Like I, I mentioned in video series four, part 4B, this is Luis Alvarez, big name, Nobel Prize in physics. Uh, his son also teaches at Berkeley, and he's uh, in the geology department. We gave him a copy of the book when it came out in 70, late 77, early 78. My, uh, my publisher gave it to him. And... This thing, this article, is published June 1980 in Journal of Science, Volume 208, number 4448. Extraterrestrial cause for the Cretaceous ter uh, Tertiary Extinction. He winds up saying that a comet <laughs> hit the Earth. 
didn't want to say the sun, but he makes a deliberate error in the, in the uh, journal, in the article, which I showed you, saying, look within uh, 0.1 light years of our solar system. Not another star far away, the closest like two, two and a half or three light years away, no. Right next door, it's right here. So, and I, I go through in, in this article how well this guy was connected. He was on the Manhattan Project too. Okay, at any rate, <laughs> when you go backwards, it took like four to five months to have something published in any of the journals. I know I used to typeset stuff for the journals. And so, and he spent a year, year and a half in going to Italy and Denmark um, collecting data, uh, sediments from various layers in the Cretaceous um, period. So that's what, that's what happened here. So he got the okay, got the money, did it, and spent, took a son, spent at least a year doing this stuff. And it comes out that he must have read the thing like you know, two or three months or four months, went to the group that he belongs to, which I, I can't remember now, but it's basically a, a closed group of military and that's it. And they said, you better go publish something and counteract whatever this guy's got. Eighth, a lot of rumors about the government building tunnels and cave systems all over the place. I don't know if it's true. It probably is. And these are just pictures of, it could be almost anything. One, I think, is a tunnel system that's under a Walmart someplace in the country, which I thought was kind of weird. This is a map that supposedly was released that supposedly represents some of those cave systems and tunnels. I don't know if any of it's true or not. Uh, there may be a little bit of truth in this thing, I don't know, but those who contracted and were, worked on these things probably should probably talk about it now. It's a good time to do it. Here's another one. These are, these are places where people have heard booms, mysterious booms and bangs and stuff like that and lights. And the, what they've been saying is it's been maybe tunnel systems and caverns underneath their towns. I don't know. I don't know if any of it's true or not, but somebody else might. September 10th, 2001, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld announced $2.3 trillion was missing from the Pentagon. How do you miss $2.3 trillion? And that's 2001. I wonder what it is now. I mean, add another trillion to it? Maybe they're using it for, well, this, looking at the material, this is a kind of white rock. This is really, I think, one of the salt mines in the Midwest, which means during the massive shaking, <laughs> this ceiling is going to come down. And this is how deep some of these caverns are. So I don't know if they're digging tunnels. It would surprise me. But if they're digging them in the, in the United States, it's a mistake. They're going to have thousands of feet of ice and snow over their heads how do they get oxygen? How do you get out? Anyway, I'll cover that in the next part of the video. The next part I have to explain. Uh, all the atheists and stuff like that are screaming their heads, all the anti-Semites are saying, he's preaching religion. I'm not doing that. This is science. <clears throat> Some of the clues are in here. Moses 10 code systems. In God's Day Judgment book creation of the Hebrew alphabet. This is really important because what he brought up out of the cave was not something he wrote. He says it was, it's the writing of God and the words of God. If you insist, replace the word God with extremely highly advanced previous civilization. I'll explain when I go through volumes one and three of my um, decoding the Hebrew alphabet, those volumes. I'll explain why Abraham bought the cave and the code systems that are used in the books in the Torah. But anyway, once you see this and you look at it, or you see the videos, video series two, parts two through four, you'll know this is the product of an extremely highly advanced previous civilization. They were at least tens of millions of years more advanced than us. And that's how you have to think of it as they had the technology and capability to be able to communicate with the operating system of the universe. I'm not kidding. So, 
there's a cryptic line. Now, I'm going to say one thing. Some alleged scholars say that Deuteronomy was written by Jeremiah because some of the words used there uh, were words that didn't show up at the time of Moses, only at the time of Jeremiah, the late temple period. That explains to me how lazy they are and how poor they are as scholars. It took me 11 months to figure out that the lineage from uh, Aaron all the way to the last high priest and also Baruch, they had three names. They had a given name when they were born. They had a priestly name when they entered the priesthood at roughly 20 years old, and they also got married. And then finally, if they were the eldest son and the father was the high priest, then they would adopt a prophet's name. They did that so the much stronger and larger countries around them, Assyria or Babylon or, uh, or Egypt, would not know what they had and how it worked. So they made it sound some, some crazy guy off in the wilderness was having a vision and wrote it down. It wasn't that at all. So <clears throat> I'll explain. I have to say further. Deuteronomy, what happened, the temple was closed for a long period of time. 20 or 30 years, and I think it was King Hezekiah opened up the temple, and he was a good king. And he handed the book. It says uh, they, they found a book of Moses in the temple, and they handed it to the scribe Shaphan. Shaphan's mentioned 15 times in Jeremiah. Guess why? because Shaphan was Jeremiah's given name. It's when he was a scribe, a young boy under 20, but must have been a very gifted scribe, and he was handed Deuteronomy, and he's the one who did the best translation he could. All those scholars who think the Torah was written over 700 years, I don't know what to say. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I think your education isn't worth a plug nickel. And, you have, and you're too lazy to try to figure it out. So now you understand what I'm getting at here. So Moses gives a clue in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 7, the following. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will declare unto thee thine elders, and they will tell thee. Now, the earlier part of this part of Deuteronomy is talking about how the Jews are going to get, uh, they're going to be burned, the flood's going to come and get them. Horrible stuff. It's the cataclysm. So I went to the two genealogies. Now, this isn't easy, especially the first one. You have to think it out, what they're doing. And so what I did, uh, in the part, they wind up saying, how old they were when the first child was born and the first to their death. And they repeat this thing twice. So Adam lived to 930 years old. And let's say Canaan was 70 when he had his first child. To death, 800, 840 years. That's 910 years. So I turned it around. I said, okay, which one of Adam's descendants was alive and still knew Adam? And it turned out it was Methuselah. Uh, and here's Adam. And Methuselah was 56 years old when Adam died. So I totaled from first birth to death, added those numbers up, and wound up with 5,974 times 2, because they repeat the story twice equals 11,948. Now, that's still not the number. The next verse, Genesis 6, 3, it says, basically, uh, the sons of God met the daughters of man, and they found them fair, and, but you're only going to live 120 years. The number 120 is mentioned three times about her age. Three times 120, 360. 360 is a circle. That's important for something later I'm going to show you. So you add that to, to the 1109, 948, and you wind up with 
12,068. The second bunch of genealogies, from Shem to Terah. Terah was the father of Abraham. So this got a little tricky because you have to think of before and after the, the reversal, the cataclysm, when the sun over. So you total from Shem, 500 years old, all the way to Terah, 2968 times two, because they, in the story it repeats everything twice. Times two is 5936, plus the 98 years before the flood, and you wind up with 6034, which is half the number. Also, this is the number of chapters and verses in the Torah. That's the 12,068. But there was a better way. When you, when you total it across, thanks to Excel, all well, the numbers, but dropping out the, years after, the two years after the, the Nova, the flood, there's the 12,068. So intellectually, you have to ask yourself, and I'm going to show you examples right after this, how does a late Bronze Age man know the exact number of years between polar reversals, cataclysms? How did he? Unless someone told him. Here's more examples. Like I mentioned, the chapters and verses in the Torah 6,034. Moses is the one who created the chapters and verses, and I showed that in, in volume three of, of um, Decoding the Hebrew Scriptures, which I haven't done the video yet, but I will do the video. Here's just one page examples. The rest, there's a lot more in series six, part two. Genesis. Noah was 500 years old when he had his three sons and was told that the earth was going to be destroyed. 500 times the length of the sacred cube at 24.136 inches is 12,068. How do you like that? The dimensions of Noah's Ark, it's all the same stuff. All these numbers either starts with a three, a five, or a six, or a half of the three, or 1.5. So it's all the same number. If it doesn't show up immediately, you divide by 12 for the 12 tribes, and you got the same number. You ignore the decimal point that it's the sequence of numbers that's the message. Somebody should have, why is all these numbers starting either a six or a three or a five? And I don't remember any discussions about that. But that's the case for everything. Noah was 600 years old when the flood started. 600 times 24.136, 14,000, blah, blah, blah. Divided by 12, it gives you the 12,068 number. How do you like that? Go through the whole thing. Um, you could pause the video and, and read them all, or go to series six, part two, or buy the book. Tenth, God's code systems. This one kind of freaked me out. In the 600 year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day of the month, on the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. I'll translate. The oceans went on the land real fast and the windows of heaven were open. Imagine the sun expanding, coming towards you. That could be like opening up the door, oh my God, where do I run to? So back to the genealogies again. This is in series seven, parts one and two. You go from Adam when he had his third son and all the others all the way down to Abraham when they had their first son. Look at the number. 2046. Second month, the 17th day. Now, the second month, as I calculated, is going to be, well, I, I should say, I figured out the, the Exodus was 1306 BCE. Orthodox tradition is, I think, is 1311 BCE. We're not far off, only a, a few years off. But the difference is, if you took a, uh, go to a, what the Jewish calendar is in 2046, you'll find they're about a month ahead of me. The second month, the end of the second month would be September 30th by my reckoning. Theirs would be the month before. Why? <clears throat> the way the lunar calendar works, they have three leap months. They're missing a leap month 
That's why they're off a month. They figured, they try to figure out the calendar based on when Moses died. I figured it out based on when Aaron was born, and you'll see why. Anyway, this comes out to, by our calendar, October 16th, 2046. Remember I said the cataclysm will be between, uh, the, the Gleisberg cycle between September and December 2046. Well, this turns out to be about dead center of that, 2046. The 11th. This also kind of, it, it, it's kind of scary. It really is for anybody, and I don't blame anyone that freak out. Once I had a drop dead date, excuse the expression, October 16, 2046, uh, what I did is, because of something that happened, you'll see in a second. I went back in time from that drop dead date every 12,068 days to see what happened. Now, when I first wrote God's Day of Judgment, <coughs> uh, October 1st, 2013 didn't happen yet. No. But I mentioned in the book, something's going to happen. I don't know what it is yet. That's the very day Netanyahu gave his speech in front of the UN that Israel will attack Iran if they build the bomb. Remember the picture with the bomb with, yeah. He said, red line there, we attack. So I went back every 12,068 days or factors thereof, and something important happened on each one of these dates uh, that directly or indirectly had to do with Israel. Uh, four cycles back was Woodrow Wilson's neutrality speech in front of the UN after World War I started in Europe. There's a bigger story. If you go to that, that the video series where I explained it a little in greater depth, the book has a lot more examples of them. But I'll, I'll go through some of the ones that are in red. Congress adapted the uh, Charles Thompson design for the Great Seal, the Eagle and the Pyramid. Um, those who say that um, um, God helped create the United States, I think they're right, not from this, but um, uh, Sir Walter Rowley, Rowley bought the contract of, um, from Humphreys to develop the new world, because Humphreys wasn't doing anything with it. And it fell exactly on one of those days, uh, cycles back. I didn't repeat them here, it's, it's in the book, but um, here's an interesting one. Book production started for the first published book, the Gutenberg Bible. Started January 24th, 1452. So Saladin took Jerusalem from the Christians, September 27th, 1187. Rome split into two empires, Byzantine and uh, ruled in Palestine, 394. Roman Emperor Hadrian renamed Jerusalem uh, uh, Alia Capitolia. Capitolina, 130, June 13th. Colosseum opened in Rome, 80, October 22nd. It was built with the wealth the Romans stole from the temple in Jerusalem. <clears throat> then they brought in, they think, about a million Jews to Rome for gladiatorial combat and mass slaughter. Romans were lovely, sweet people, weren't they? Alexander the Great captured Jerusalem, 332 BCE. First time Jerusalem fell to Babylon, 596. Solomon's temple was plundered by Pharaoh Shik Shiknuk, 910 BCE. The Battle of Mal uh, Amalek in Raphidim. That's the date of when the, the uh, Exodus was. And when I get to volume three in, in Decoding the Hebrew Scriptures, you'll see it. I have actually, just every day I know exactly where he was and when the, uh, the excess actually happened, which was in the fall, not the spring. <coughs> Aaron's birth, 1389 BCE. Notice that from that you wind up 83 years old. That's how old he was that Moses says. Uh, when the Exodus happened. Tutmosis III died, 11 of the 12 tribes of Israel were enslaved within the year. 
I go into that's volume two stuff. You really like that. Joseph becomes prime minister of Egypt, 1488 BCA, July 12th. Abraham was, sac was to sacrifice Isaac at Mount Sinai, 1620 BCE, September 9th. Estimated date for Terah's, Abraham's father's birth. <clears throat> Somebody has to be able to explain to me. Oh, I think it's some. Well, all the events are dropped in date of October 16th. Only entity that could possibly make things happen on specific time and dates is the operating system of the universe. Hopefully, everybody's smart enough to, to understand this. This is not an accident. There was a lot more. I found like 40 or 45 of these things. Somebody's got to come up with an explanation other than this one, which seems to be pretty logical. What's happening here? Is this a created reality and this has been so programmed? How much free will do we really have? The number of days between when Moses first arrived at the real Mount Sinai was mid-February 1306. Remember, he was grazing sheep. I explained in one of the books to prove that the Exodus was in the fall. All sheep in the northern hemisphere are born roughly in March, a little bit in April. It takes them 45 days. Uh, the lambs to become weaned from the mother and big enough to walk. They have 15 pounds. They have to get 15 pounds. This is not a joke. This is, I didn't figure this until later after the expedition. This is the first expedition. Mid-February 1306 BC, when I arrived at the, at the real Mount Sinai, the real hell, it was exactly 1,206,800 days after Moses was there. I can't make this stuff up, folks. I'm not that creative. Next video is going to cover the recap of, like I said, uh, the recap of what happens in the, in the events uh, leading up to the reversal, the reversal and what happens after, where to build stuff, and what structures to build. I hope you got something out of this. I hope you learned something. Die Hole Foundation is a 501c3. Uh, nonprofit Science Foundation. Its job is to figure out what side of the Earth is going to be facing the sun the next time it novas. That will give us an idea of what to build and where to build it. I hope that helped you.